Thank you for joining this edition of CMEO Briefcase entitled Differentiating Psoriasis and Skin of Color. Dr. Joel Gelfand has been kind enough to share his thoughts and insights with us today. Dr. Gelfand is Professor of Dermatology and Epidemiology, Vice Chair of Clinical Research, Medical Director, Dermatology Clinical Studies Unit, Director, Psoriasis and Phototherapy Treatment Center at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine in Philadelphia. Dr. Gelfand is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in psoriasis, clinical epidemiology, drug safety, and clinical trials. He is the author of over 200 scientific publications, editorials, reviews, and textbook chapters, which appear in journals such as JAMA, British Medical Journal, European Heart Journal, Annals of Rheumatic Disease, JAMA Dermatology, the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, and the Journal of Infectious Disease. These are Dr. Galfan's disclosures. Our learning objective for today's CMEO cast is to improve diagnostic accuracy of psoriasis in patients with skin of color based on knowledge of notable differences in disease presentation. Welcome, Dr. Galfan. Welcome to this CMEO briefcase, Differentiating Psoriasis and Skin of Color. Our learning objective is to improve diagnostic accuracy of psoriasis in patients with skin of color based on knowledge of notable differences in disease presentation. We'll do this through a case-based learning. Let's talk about Brenda. She's 55 years old, has a BMI of 26. She's had psoriasis since her early 40s, and it affects several areas of her body, her arms, her legs, and her face. Her main symptoms are itching, which results in a loss of sleep and pain in her skin. Generally, she's better in the summer, worse with stress, and her prior treatment was used to Kinumab, which was quite effective for her. Uh, Currently, she's not on any therapy. Our family history is notable for a father who has hypertension. She has no history of psoriasis in her family or arthritis. Uh, She's not a smoker, doesn't drink alcohol or or use drugs. Her past medical history is very relevant to our decision-making, but she had lung cancer in 2015. She also has pre-diabetes, hypertension, and had uh, prior exposure to tuberculosis, but had received antibiotic therapy. Uh, her lab results uh, objectively were uh, notable for having the blood pressure that was mildly elevated. Her physical exam demonstrated uh, psoriasis affecting about 7% of her body surface area, characteristic lesions on her arms, chest, uh, legs, uh, upper back, uh, with a PGA of three, which means a sort of moderately thick red and elevated plaques. So the question is, how would you treat Brenda by presenting this way? So her chief complaint uh, today is that her itching is making her crazy, especially at night. It's warm in her office and she doesn't want to wear short sleeves or V-necks because it's so embarrassing. I don't even want to go to church because I feel like I look awful. And this is a really common theme that our patients will bring up to us uh, with their psoriasis. They may be more um, feel urgent need to get their disease under control as we get into warmer summer months when they can no longer camouflage or cover up their disease. So in a person of color, the first thing to think about is, you know, does having psoriasis affect people's health related quality of life differently uh, based on uh, people of color versus uh, Caucasians? So this is an interesting study that was done looking at uh, the impacts of psoriasis on the health related quality of life in African American patients compared to uh, Caucasians. And what they show is that basically for the mental health component uh, of the short form 36, uh, sort of uh, general measure of health related quality of life, as well as for the sorority qual, which is a measure of psoriasis related quality of life, uh, patients with uh, psoriasis who are African American tend to fare worse uh, than patients who are Caucasian. And we don't entirely know why this is, whether or not disease may be more symptomatic, for example, in the patient case we're giving today where she has a lot of itching, uh, but certainly, you know, as clinicians, the added burden of post-inflammatory skin changes, such as hypopigmentation or hyperpigmentation, uh, are a significant challenge for people of color. A recent study by a colleague of mine, Junko Takeshja at Penn, uh, looked at Medicare records of uh, over 4,000 patients with psoriasis, uh, and they were looking at uh, what were the factors associated with lack of use of biologics. And some things would, would uh, be not surprising. Uh, cancer, for example, uh, those patients with history of cancer are less likely to use biologics for psoriasis. 
Um, lack of a Part D, it's a type of uh, health insurance subsidy for prescriptions uh, that also reduced the likelihood of being on biologics, not surprising given the cost of these therapies in the Medicare population. Uh, and then what was surprising to us was, uh, was race was important, that uh, people, that African Americans had a roughly 70% reduction in the likelihood of uh, going on biologics for psoriasis in the Medicare population. And this is a little bit of a surprising finding uh, given that the earlier data I showed you suggest that uh, people of color have a greater burden of disease. So this slide is, is another study done by Dr. Kestra trying to better understand the reasons for differences in use of therapies uh, in, in African Americans compared to Caucasians. And what Dr. Takeshita did in this study was uh, survey dermatologists in the United States, uh, given them these case vignettes that were identical, uh, except for one change, was that the picture of the person she showed as the example. So it could have been a white Caucasian male, uh, white Caucasian female, uh, African American male, African American female. And clearly what uh, Junko uh, was able to demonstrate in this data uh, was that, um, that there was much less confidence in the diagnosis of psoriasis uh, when the patient was African American compared to when the patient was Caucasian. And so this diagnostic uncertainty may be playing uh, some role here. And there are certainly some nuances that one needs to consider. Uh, of course, in people of color, uh, the erythema is going to be less conspicuous. It may, it may appear violaceous or even hyperpigmented. Uh, there'll be uh, a lot more secondary skin changes post-inflammatory hypo or hyperpigmentation. Uh, and there's a lot of potential clinical mimickers of psoriasis in people of color. And so uh, lichenified eczema could look very psoriasis-like, uh, lichen planus. Uh, especially the hypertrophic type that has a lot of scale can look like psoriasis. Uh, cutaneous lupus erythematosus, both a discoid variant and, and to some extent a subacute variant, which can look psoriasiform. And certain infections, tinea corporis or tinea captus, have to be considered. Uh, other things to consider is uh, scalp psoriasis in, in, in people of color, uh, the impact of hair texture, styling practices, washing frequency. Uh, all these things influence how we think about the disease, uh, the right vehicle to use in treating patients. Uh, and it's very important to discuss with the patient what their preferences are uh, without making any uh, overall uh, conclusions before we actually discuss it with them. Uh, in my practice, a lot of my patients uh, who are African American tend to prefer uh, oils for their, for their hair, uh, ointments, if you will, uh, as opposed to liquid solutions, which would be quite drying. Uh, it's also important to consider the traditional or cultural therapies used prior to the consult to see if there's alternative therapies that may be playing a role or, or driving uh, an allergic type contact dermatitis. Uh, and it's important to understand that uh, those who have more severe skin disease uh, may have a greater impairment uh, in their health related quality of life. Now we have a number of good options for treating people with psoriasis. And so a lot of this is understanding what is our therapeutic armamentarium and then working with the patient to make, to choose the one that best fits their values and their underlying health situation. Uh, so of course we know that biologics, uh, TNF inhibitors, uh, used to Kinumab uh, and the IL-23s and the IL-17s all have good efficacy. Uh, they have, um, uh, they're usually very well tolerated. Um, we know that TNF inhibitors have concerns around uh, malignancy, at least according to their labeling. Uh, used to Kinumab also has labeling uh, raising potential concern for issues around malignancy. Uh, the 23s and the 17s don't have labeling uh, about a cancer risk. Uh, but still, when a patient has a history of lung cancer, I think there's a lot of trepidation about using immune modulating therapies uh, in this setting. And so if we're going to pursue a biologic for her, it really would have to be made as a team decision discussing with her oncologist and make sure they were on board with such, a, such an approach. Of course, we have a variety of oral medications, uh, acetretin, opremolast, cyclosporin, methotrexate. Uh, now, the, the four of these, uh, the four of these, really the only one that's not thought to be immunomodulatory to a significant degree is acetretin. Uh, so if I was gonna use a premolast, a cyclosporin, and methotrexate, again, I would certainly want to discuss it with our oncology team to make sure they were okay with these therapies. And, and in my clinical experience, it's pretty variable. In some cases, uh, oncologists are okay. In other cases, they're really, not, they're really not comfortable with using these agents. So it's, it's very much an individual decision. 
And that brings us to phototherapy. Uh, phototherapy has been around for over 50 years for the treatment of psoriasis. Uh, the clear, almost clear rates are estimated to be about 50 to 80 percent, which is similar to the effects you may get with biologics in some cases. When using phototherapy, it's important to counsel the patients about the risk of burns, which can be serious if uh, there's a mistake in dosing, uh, aging of the skin, photoaging, tanning, reactivation of herpes simplex virus, and the need for shielding of genital skin in men, and the theoretical risk of skin cancer with long-term use. Now, in a patient of color, a lot of these concerns are, are not as significant. Uh, their risk of developing skin cancer, for example, uh, related to ultraviolet B phototherapy is going to be negligible. And we actually have some interesting head-to-head -head data, biologics compared to phototherapy. As part of a trial we were doing to really understand the effects of these therapies on cardiovascular disease. Uh, but as a result, we were also looking at uh, efficacy measures, and it gives us a sense of how does phototherapy compare to a biologic like adalutumab in this case, or, or compared to placebo, under traditional measures of, of, of efficacy that we look at in clinical trials. And what was quite striking from this study is that we actually saw that uh, phototherapy uh, and adalutumab had quite comparable objective improvements in the skin. Uh, roughly uh, half of patients uh, having a POSI 75 in this clinical trial. Now, it's, it's a fairly small study. And then the PGA clear almost clear was, uh, you know, was uh, good in, in both groups as well, trending towards a better response in adalutumab. Important to re remember that in this clinical trial, the patients were really selected who are really biologic candidates. Uh, they would ultimately go on to add aluminum at week 12 for a longer duration of treatment because we're really interested in the effects of TNF inhibitors on cardiovascular functioning. And so a lot of these patients may have had a type of psoriasis you wouldn't treat with phototherapy if they had a lot of inverse disease or scalp disease or nail disease. You wouldn't expect those areas to improve with phototherapy. In our patient discussing today, most of her psoriasis is in visible, easily treated areas. The other thing that was sort of interesting in our study is that phototherapy decreased inflammation by C-reactive protein in IL-6. IL-6 is known to be causally related to cardiovascular disease, and also increased uh, HDLP, uh, one of the uh, forms of good cholesterol, which would pretend potentially an improvement in cardiovascular risk compared to placebo. So it is possible that phototherapy may have cardiovascular benefits that haven't been fully detected to date. When we looked at the um, patient report outcomes, this was quite striking, actually. We found, of course, that, uh, that these uh, therapies were a good response in health-related quality of life. Uh, but in general, the trends were that prototherapy may have had even better responses on, on the patient reported outcomes than adalimumab. And that's kind of a striking finding. And how much of that is due to phototherapy itself or just a contact with our staff, you know, our nurses uh, who care for our patients, seeing these people two or three times a week, uh, that may also play an important role in the benefits these patients receive in health related quality of life. I'll also call your attention to the idea that the pain dimension uh, improved as well, uh, these measures of people getting phototherapy. And we do know that uh, ultraviolet light uh, does have an effect on endorphins and things of that nature. And it is plausible uh, that this is a real finding that patients have improvement in pain and well being when they're using phototherapy. So it's really important when we're evaluating our patients in clinical practice uh, to have some measurement of what is going on with the patient's disease, uh, ideally an objective measurement we could follow over time. Uh, this is due to nuances and impact on daily life. It's important to have some sense of disease severity and the patient's perspective or their quality of life at, at every visit. Uh, there's a variety of tools available to us. This includes just doing a simple measurement of the body surface area, doing a physician's global assessment, which is often rating uh, the, the overall characteristics of the plaques on a scale of zero to five, uh, and looking at about how red, thick, or scaly the patches are, with five being very severe and zero being essentially clear. Uh, one could multiply the PGA by the BSA, and the reason to consider doing that is that we know that that number correlates very well with a POSI. POSI uh, is something that we use for clinical trials. It's kind of cumbersome for clinical practice, uh, but we feel if you're measuring the BSA and a global assessment, the PGA, uh, that will give you a pretty good sense of what's going on with the patient, equivalent to what the information you get from, from the, the more labor-intensive POSI score. Uh, to do a body surface area assessment, uh, the way we think about it is the patient's palm, their, uh, their hand, including their fingers, and how many spots of psoriasis on their body, uh, how many palms it would take of, their, of the patient to cover all the spots of psoriasis in their body. Uh, typically, for a patient to enter a clinical trial for psoriasis, 
they have about 10% of their body involved uh, with their disease or more. The Dermatology Life Quality Index, this is a survey that can be given to patients, only 10 questions, uh, easy to administer. We often don't do this in clinical practice um, as our practice is so busy. Uh, but one simple thing I do in my practice is global assessments of the impact on physical and emotional health. And so we'll ask patients on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the worst, uh, how bad are your physical symptoms of psoriasis in the last week? You know, the itching, burning, pain. Uh, and then once we have that information, we'll ask the patient, well, thinking about the emotional impact of this disease on your, on your well-being, uh, feelings of, of worry or anxiety or depression or isolation from your psoriasis, on a scale of zero to 10, how bad is it in the last week, 10 being the worst? And um, this, these numbers are really helpful uh, to have a, a patient perspective as you're making decisions. You know, some of our patients may have a low body surface area estimate. Like my patient before that we're discussing today with a body surface area of 7%, she would not have qualified traditionally for a clinical trial, wouldn't meet the traditional definition of moderate severe psoriasis. However, she has significant impairment in health-related quality of life and has disease extensive enough that clinically, uh, systemic agents of phototherapy are certainly indicated. So let's come back uh, to Brenda now and uh, reiterate some of the, the key findings of, of her history. She's in her mid-50s. She has highly symptomatic psoriasis affecting primarily, predominantly visible areas in her arms, legs, upper back and mid chest. Uh, she gets better in the summertime and previously did well with eustachinumab, but that was stopped when she had a lung cancer diagnosis in 2015. And so based on the information you heard uh, from this lecture today, how would you treat Brenda now? So I think we have some, uh, some smart goals that come out of this work uh, today. I think it's very important to take into consideration the potential racial and ethnic differences in clinical presentation, cultural factors, and desired treatment outcomes. I think certainly as clinicians, we have a, you know, a strong goal of reducing health disparities and improving outcomes for all of our patients. So I think that earlier data that I showed you from Dr. Takeshita uh, about the decreased use of biologics in African Americans is concerning to us. We want to understand this phenomenon more. Uh, I think the most important part is making sure our patients are really well educated. So in the patient we presented today, we would talk about all the different treatment options, uh, injectable biologics, oral medications, phototherapy, possibly topicals as well, but she was failing those, and then have a process of shared decision-making that would uh, lead us to the best outcome for our patient. And I think that these are works of discussion that occur over time in our patients. You know, psoriasis is a lifelong disease. Uh, patients on average have had it for about two decades when we're managing them. Uh, and they have a lot of experience uh, and a lot of their own uh, ideas of what they think will help for them. And it's important we incorporate that uh, into our treatment plan. So in this particular case, when the patient says, well, my surprises gets better in sunlight, uh, that's a hint to us that using ultraviolet light phototherapy is likely to be pretty helpful for this person. Of course, the impact on health-related quality of life is quite important. So for this patient whose life is being disrupted by her psoriasis, if she felt phototherapy wasn't appropriate for her or, or, or wasn't responding to it, uh, then certainly uh, it would be worthwhile speaking to her oncology care team and discussing a variety of other options we have to bring to bear uh, to help her. So with that, I'll ask you to complete your evaluation and provide feedback on future topics, formats, and presenters. We rely on your feedback greatly to shape our future educational activities. To claim uh, ABIM MOC credit, complete the post-test evaluation at the conclusion of the webcast, and be sure to fill in your ABIM ID number and, and DOB, month and date, on the evaluation so you should be sure to submit your credit to ABIM. Thank you for joining me today in this educational activity, and I hope it's helped you achieve better outcomes for your patients.